Good morning, everybody. Check, check, check. Oh, there we go. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, Yes, uh, we're going off to sunny Queensland. Uh, We're going to work in the youth department there. And uh, we'll be helping oversee youth work for the South uh, Queensland uh, region, which goes from the Coolangatta all the way up through to um, Rockhampton and then across to the Northern Territory. So it's uh, quite a a reasonable area. But we've had a great time here. And so this is actually my last sermon here in uh, New Zealand. So I'm I'm glad to be here this morning with my wife, Ariana, and uh, some of our extended families here as well. So uh, it's really neat to be here on, uh, on this day with you guys. And also, um, I love riding motorbikes and four-wheel driving. So it looks like I missed out on some fun there. You know, when it comes down to um, having a hopeless situation, it's always better, isn't it, when we've got people that are around there to help us. Is that right? When you're in a hopeless situation and you're alone, it's never a good thing. But when you're in a situation where you've got people around you, you cope so much better. One of those places where you're on your own is when you go to Woolworths. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when you turn up at Woolies, the first thing you do when you go through the door, and you step through the door and other people are heading for the same spot, you've got to choose a shopping trolley, right? Dangerous thing. And, and usually you don't want to be kind of, you know, too uh, high maintenance about it because, you know, people are starting to come in behind you and you're going, okay, now which, which lane will I go? Uh, there's three lots here. Uh, which trolley is going to be the winner? And you march up to one, you grab a trolley, you pull it out... You get it out, and then you've you got to manoeuvre it through the little gateway with the little clacker things that they often have on the side, and you've arrived. And you're looking around, you've got to go up certain aisles, and there's a little bit of a trolley jam just when you get through that thing. As everyone gets through and go, okay, where do we go now? I mean, everyone's gone shopping a million times before. You'd think you'd know where you're going, right? But everyone, oh, okay, I'm in the shopping centre now, and I've got my trolley. And the worst thing about it is that, uh, for me, is that if you've got a good trolley, <laughs> oh yeah, I changed pretty well, didn't I? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm on easy street. This thing is rolling nice. And every now and then, you get this hopeless situation with a shopping trolley with a mind of its own. <laughs> and, and you're trying to steer the thing, and you're nearly twisting your, your kneecaps around sideways because it keeps on wanting to drift one way. And then if you're really unlucky, you get one of those shopping trolleys that someone's ground off the wheels in one spot. And you, when you're starting out slow, it's not too bad because you don't realise what you've got. And, and then suddenly as you're going along and you get further into the shopping centre, you hear the hum. And you go, oh, no. And the more weight you put in the shopping trolley, the more insistent it gets. And you're thumping along, you know, and, and, and everyone's looking. Oh, I, I can hear a noise. And, it, whoop, and everyone's looking at you. And you go, oh, I know, just look away. It's a hopeless situation. Nothing I can do about it now. I'm too proud to go back and get another trolley. And, you know, people think that. Uh, and so we have a hopeless situation. Just trying to get a right trolley to pick up your groceries with. The other hopeless situation you often find yourself in is if you're coming to Fongaray, that happens to be if you have to pass through Auckland. Yes, very hopeless situation. And it took us an hour and a half just to get through from the south side of Auckland to the north side. And you're trying to pick a lane. And it doesn't matter sometimes which lane you pick. It all comes to a grinding halt and you're inching along. And... It's a hopeless situation. You can't get out of it. There are things that come to us in life that we can't escape. And that's the worst thing. So what do we do when we come to those things in life that we just can't escape? And and you think like, oh man, I've picked the dud trolley. Or I've picked the wrong lane. And you're getting more frustrated with life. But it makes it easier 
in life when you have a hopeless situation if you have people and friends around you. Well, Mary and Martha were in a hopeless situation. Their brother Lazarus, Laz for short, was really crook. And he got so sick that he was on his deathbed. And so they'd seen Jesus do miracles before. And so they thought, well, hey, they didn't get on the phone because there wasn't a phone to be got onto. And so they sent the uh, turbocharged donkey with a messenger on it up to its place out of town uh, to send a message there to Jesus. And they say, hey, Jesus, look, your mate Lazarus is sick. You need to jet on back here and help fix him up. And Jesus is pretty cool about it. He kind of, hey, I'm enjoying my time here. I'm just going to relax. And he waits a couple of days. And then he says to his disciples, hey, look, I think it's time. Let's go back. You know, and at that time, Jesus, he was pretty popular and unpopular at the same time. I remember the way at school once, and that was the case. Everyone at school was chasing me, not because I was popular, because they were wanting to bash me. So I don't know what I'd said, but I mustn't have said something that wasn't in the Bible. Um, and they were really upset. And so Jesus had this group of people that were really against him. And so going back to Judea was not a great idea. And so Thomas, one of the disciples, says, Hey, yeah, let's all go back with you, Jesus, and we'll all get killed. There's always someone looking on the bright side, isn't there? And so anyway, Jesus said, No, come on, guys, you're going to see something here. I'm going to show you something that you'll never, ever forget. And so they head back, and, and as they come back, by this stage, Martha hears that Jesus is coming into Bethany. And Bethany is about um, three k's out of um, Jerusalem. And this is where these guys lived and they were best friends of Jesus. And so as, it, as they're turning up to the outskirts of Bethany, news comes in, hey, Jesus is on his way into town. And so Martha gets out there and she flies out. And if you look in your Bibles, and this story is found in John chapter um, 11, and, and he's coming into town, and we're going to look, I want to look at John 11, and it says here, um, that verse 20, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. If you'd been here. And sometimes in our lives we wonder, is God here? I mean, when you look around and you see stuff that's going on, you're going, where is God? Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then she says, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again, verse 23. And Martha says, yeah, on the resurrection day, you know, at the very end when God raises all those who believe in him again, hey, yeah, he's going to rise again. See, Martha believed. She was a believer in the resurrection for those who believe in Jesus. And the interesting thing is, is that Jesus, and I want you to look at this promise this morning with me in verse 25. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. Do you believe this, Martha? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the creator. He's the creative God. Always has, always will be. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, it's it's funny, I haven't been, has anyone been on a in a plane accident here? Just put your hand up. Well, that's probably why you're here. Uh, Most people in plane accidents don't actually walk away from them. And um, but you never hear of people that are about to die saying, I don't believe in you, God. Everyone's crying out to God for their very life, aren't they? 
There's very few atheists when the plane's going down. Suddenly everyone gets real spiritual, just in case. What happens if there is a God? And so, well, we better check out, check in here. You know, it's about time to check in and see what's going on. And so, you know, when, when the chips are down and we are unable to have the answers for ourselves, we reach out and there is a saviour. And I, the reason I'm sharing this story this morning Because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. I am the resurrection. And that's the power of the gospel. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And there are hundreds of witnesses to that. Well, Martha says... Yes, Lord, I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. And then she left him and and returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. And Mary went immediately, ran out. And she heads off out and all the mourners turned up. And, And sometimes in those days, they used to hire mourners as well and they would come in. And, um, and so everyone sort of saw Mary get up and run out of the house and thought, well, she might be going down to the tomb because Lazarus had been dead for four days. So everyone came out and they followed her out there and, um, and then she falls at Jesus' feet. An incredible scene. And she asked the same question that Martha asked. Where have you been if you'd only been here? And Jesus saw what was going on. And it's the shortest verse in the Bible. What is it? Jesus wept. I don't know, there's some of your parents here. Have you ever had an experience where your kids grew up to be something that you didn't wish that they'd grow up to be? I don't have children yet because one of us is not mature enough it's not my wife. <laughs> but if you're training up your child and they grow up to be an axe murderer or something like that, it's not exactly what you had in mind for your kid, right? And so same, same here. You know, when a sense that you, you have this hope that your children will grow up to, do, to be something, to be um, a good contributor to society, to do something with their lives. You have this hope that there's going to be a future for your kids, your children. And so all these people are gathered around and it seems like there is no hope. If you'd only been here, what is the future going to hold? If you'd only been here, then maybe things could have been different. Maybe we could have done things differently and maybe you could have done a miracle here, Lord, and and fix the problem up for us. Jesus wept. When you create something and it doesn't work out how you want it to be, it hurts, doesn't it? And what God has in mind for every one of us is eternal life. What he has in mind for us is a future. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for a future, plans to prosper you and to give you hope. That's the kind of plans that God has for your life. I don't know what plans you have for your life, but they're the kind of plans I want for my life. A future, a hope, and to be prosperous. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Isn't that what everyone wants? God says, I've got plans for your life. God had plans for this universe. He had plans for the human race. But along the way, free choice has meant that many have chosen a different plan to their life than what God had in mind for you. Now, 
I don't know if any of you have ever bought something new. Who's one of those people who reads the manuals that come with stuff that you get? Are there any manual readers out yet? Yeah, okay, a few manual readers. Who are the people that you just plug it in, you start it up, and then you hear crunch sounds? You go, whoop, should have read the manual. Okay, we've got a few of them here. There's <laughs> a few of those, all right. Okay, you know, when you read the manual, you figure out how the best way to look after the thing that you've just got, right? And the Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. So you'd think that when people come into the world, you would check out the manual to see how things would work best for human beings. And the Bible is like that. It's a manual to give you the most out of life. It's a manual that gives you eternal life because it connects you with God. And if you believe in God, there is that promise of a future resurrection. It's not just the here and now, which is pretty good. Auntie Lucy, I think you've been around a little bit longer than me. Now, we talked earlier and you said to me, how time flies. It was only like yesterday. And yesterday becomes 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, doesn't it, some, for some? All right? Now... When, when we have these experiences in life, life goes by so quickly and if that's all life is, that's why you want to suck the marrow out of it. And so some people say, oh, I'm going to live for the moment. Whatever you can get, whatever you can experience, you just suck out of it, you get whatever you can from it and you move on because it's all over. But I don't know about you, when there is an offer of eternal life, versus a short life, I'd rather take the eternal life. And that's what God has on offer for everyone, that we, if we believe in him, that we would have eternal life. And that's the hope that Christians have. Jesus wept because the situation was not how he had intended it to be. God had such different plans for humanity. And then Jesus asked them, where have you put him? And they said, come, come and see. And Jesus was standing outside the tomb and that's where he wept. See how much he loved him, some were saying. And then Jesus said something. He said, roll the stone away. Roll the stone away in front of the entrance. And some are going, hang on, this is the Middle East. It's hot out here, right? And you roll that stone away, there's going to be some honking smell coming out of that place. Now you, you just don't want to do that. I mean, there's crowds of people here. If you want to, you know, see the body and things like that, you know, at least, you know, like wait until everyone else is gone and then roll the stone away, but don't do it now. Jesus said, roll the stone away. And they rolled the stone away. And then Jesus prays and then he calls Lazarus out of the tomb and everyone's watching and this guy comes out wrapped in grave clothes. I used to wrap them around with like these like bandages. He come out looking like the Michelin man. For those of you who remember the Michelin tire ads years ago, the white man and saw the little... He come out, out and people's eyes are just drawn to the scene. And this guy, he walks out, stumbling. And Jesus says, unwrap him and set him free. The hugest miracle that happened to date in the New Testament. The resurrection of Lazarus. It's interesting because later on, Jesus also rose from the tomb. Amazing. But there is resurrection if you believe in Jesus Christ. There is new life. I am the resurrection and the life. The I am, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And we have different time frames to God. Sometimes we want God to, to do stuff in our time frame and other time, times God says, no, listen, he's fought the good fight, he's run the race, he's finished 
what he's set out to do. And as Christians, that's why we have this faith, we have this hope, and we believe in the God who can resurrect people from the dead. And the greatest resurrection is going to happen at the end of time when Jesus comes back and it says in the Bible that the dead in Christ will rise and they'll meet the Lord in the air. That's a triumph of the gospel. You can put a good man down. But as far as God's concerned, a good man doesn't stay down because he's going to rise him up and raise him up again to new life. That's why you can live your life with conviction. That's why you don't have to suck the marrow out of everything that you do in this life. That's why you can be a giving person. That's why you can be generous to others. That's why we can do a whole range of things as believers in Christ because we know that we have eternity to live life. What a privilege. What an awesome thing. You know, in the world, there's about 33% of the world are Christians. 33%. There's millions of Christians all over the world waiting for the return of Christ. Professors in science... Doctors, lawyers, carpenters, plumbers, mechanics, storemen, storewomen, anything you can think, any job you can think about, there are people who have read their Bible and recognize that there is something greater in our world and that God has a plan for everyone's life here. I am, Jesus says the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? I say to you, do you believe this? I just want to um, share with you I was um, speaking at a high school for a week and uh, there was this 17-year-old boy, Martin, a lanky guy, you know, you know those young fellas that they barely had their voice breaking, you know, hello, hello, and, uh, you know, and they come up to you and, and he looks at me with all the honesty you can muster and, and he says, uh, hey, Steve, um, can I pray for you? And I said, <laughs> yes, that would be great. And, uh, and so he prayed for me and, um, and I said, hey, thanks, Martin. And he goes, hey, can I be your chaplain for the week? I said, That's the first time I've had a young person ask me if they could be my chaplain. Hey, I'm, I'm the pastor, aren't I? No. I said, and I said, Martin, that'd be fantastic. I'd really love that. And so every day Martin would come to me before I spoke at the school and he'd pray for me. Incredible experience to have a young person come and pray for you. And uh, he, I went out the back and they had like some water and stuff out there. And I found a little note that Martin had written to me. And it says, uh, I'll just read it to you. It's given me uh, two texts. First one's Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. The second thing he wrote in here was a quote. And uh, sorry, ladies, it's a bit sexist, but um, it'll save me trying to transpose it, so I'll just read it as it is. It says, Man is never so tall as when he kneels before God, never so great as when he humbles himself before God, and the man who kneels to God can stand to anything. The woman who kneels to God can stand to anything. Amen. Romans ten fourteen. But how shall they ask to save them? unless they believe in him. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And that's our role as Christians, to tell others the good news about Jesus so they too can believe in God. And I have a guess, Paul, that that's what your life has been about in the last number of years. That you want to share the good news about Jesus, to be a man of faith that others might look at you 
and they say, look at Paul. There's a guy who believes in the Lord, a guy who's got values, a guy who is sincere, and a guy who has a love for Jesus Christ. And I know that in any family, like my own family, my brother currently is not really walking close to the Lord, eh? And it's my greatest wish that my brother would be close to Jesus. Why? Because there's only one gift that you can give somebody else that's better than any other gift. Have you ever been Christmas shopping before? I'm really dreading what's coming up because, you know, it's so commercialised and everything. It's not so much about Christ anymore. It's so much, you know, it's about presents and everything else. And, you know, um, and when you go out shopping for people that got everything pretty much, you know what I'm talking about? And you're going, oh, you know, what can we get them? And you're looking and you just, oh, they've already got stuff. You know, you, you just get tired of it. But when we go out and we seek gifts for people, if you were to give one gift, if you were to give the ultimate gift to somebody else, what would you give them? Would it be a toaster? I mean, what would you give somebody if you had one gift to show another person how much you valued them, what is it that you would give them? You give them Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're wanting to have them to. That's why I'm a minister of the gospel. That's why I believe in Jesus, so that I can share with others and say, "Hey, you got a choice. You can believe, or you you don't have to." The great thing about God is He doesn't force people. And so, for all of us here, and also for Paul's family, the greatest gift for us as a church to give to anybody else is that beautiful gift of Jesus Christ and the freedom that comes with living for Him. Sometimes people look at Christianity and they say, oh, you don't do this and you don't do that. And I say, no, 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 it's not. (laughs) You got it wrong. This is what we do. This is how we want to love other people. This is what we want to make a difference in our world. This is the kind of things that, you know, it's not about what we don't do. It's about what we do in Christ because we've got freedom to do a whole bunch of great stuff. And so for everyone here, the best gift that you could give somebody else is the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Paul, you fought the good fight. You finish off strong. No matter what happens, you keep swinging for the fences. You keep walking with the Lord. You keep your faith firm in his word. And your life will be a testimony to this church and also to your family. eternal life, hope in a hopeless world where things come and go just like that. God offers every one of us eternal hope and there's a resurrection, there is new life for everyone who would just reach out and say, God, I just want something more in my life other than things. I want that deep-seated peace that comes from that connection with God that is never found until you let go and you let God into your life. You can run, but you can never outrun God. You can hide, but He'll always see you. And He's always there saying, Hey, just believe in me. And I am the resurrection and the life. Hey, Paul, I want to invite you to come up the front and um, just up here. And, and if uh, your family that are here today would like you guys just to come up and stand with, um, with uh, Paul. 
and I'm just going to ask some of the elders of the church to come up and we'd just like to pray for Paul and we'd also like to pray for you guys as a family. Because when you're in a spot where it's a hopeless situation, you need to have people that are around you. Come up here, Paul. I want, you, I want you as a family just to gather around Paul, put your arms around him. Dear Father, we come to you in brokenness. There's many opportunities and, and sometimes we feel they're lost opportunities. But today, Lord, we, we just dedicate Paul to you. We know that he loves you. He may not have always felt like he's got it right. Maybe there are some regrets with family sometimes as well. But Lord, I know that he had asked forgiveness from you. And I pray that you'll strengthen and encourage him no matter what the future holds at this point. But whether he lives longer or whether he should die, we know that he has eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Lord, for the family, may they realise that there is a church community here that loves them, that are ready to put their arms around them and support them. Lord, if in the family as well there's some hearts that have been running from you, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would gently speak to them and impress upon them the wonderful life that can be found through you. Please be with um, all of us, Lord. May we be faithful. We seek you out in our moment of crisis. And we place our trust in you. And we do this in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. love you all anyway. And I must tell you that I'm not afraid of what I have to or presumably have to face up to. I only know what the doctors tell me but uh, I accept the situation and I make no secret of that and I, I, I've worked on the philosophy the more people that know something of this nature the more that will support you and pray for you. And I couldn't ask for anything more than the wonderful friends I had, have here in this congregation. And I thank God for that privilege. Thank you. We're going to um, have a hymn, and I've, I've chosen this one, um, and it's called Stand Like the Brave. And uh, it's a great hymn, and I think it'd be a, a really encouraging hymn. And you know, when, when things are tough, that's when we need to have our friends around us, our family around us, and we need hope hope for a future and I'm so glad that um, you're all here today and for Paul's family thank you so much for coming and supporting him and I know that this means a, an incredible amount to him today to have you here and uh, you know um, 
if in the past as well anyone's felt hurt by the church or misunderstood, you know, this, we seek forgiveness and um, apologise for anything that, that may have caused offence. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. We're going to sing this song and then I'm going to read one last promise from God's word to close. Let's stand, shall we? Romans chapter 15, verse 13. So I pray that God, who gives you hope and will keep you happy and full of peace as you believe in him, may you overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's my prayer for you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.